we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we Would 
Put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently by putting your hand in the hand of the man from We're no different fellows than what I profess to be And it causes me shame to know I'm not the person I should be Put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the water Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea Take a look at yourself and you can look at others by putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Mama taught me how to pray before I reached the age of seven. When I'm down on my knees, that's when I'm close to heaven. Daddy lived his life with us kids and a wife, and he did what he could do. He showed me enough of what it takes to get you through. Put your hand in the hand of the man who stills the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calms the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently by putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Sorrow, still follow the 
soon shall be fitted for service above. For a long time I traveled. Jesus, tis now. 
we say that with our hearts. If ever I loved thee, my Jesus. Welcome each of you here this morning, our worship service. Thank you for being here. And to the visitors, I extend a special welcome to you. I trust that you feel the presence of Jesus this morning and come and worship with us again. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning and we thank you that you are here with us now. We thank you that because of the perfect sacrifice that you gave, because of your life, your death, and your resurrection, we have a reason to be here. And God, this morning as we worship you in song, and we worship you in, in your word, and we worship you in our fellowship, in our time together as a body, we just pray that this would all be done to lift up your name to bring you honor and glory. So Father, we pray your blessing upon our service this morning, each facet and each part. We pray that your spirit would lead us and it would guide us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to be in Romans chapter 8 this morning for a devotion. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. I always love the book of Romans. It's one of those books that Paul wrote very uh, uh, in order and in sequence. He builds on everything and everything comes off of what he just talked about. And as, we moved, as he moves into Romans chapter 8, he moves into the believer and what the believer has in comparison to what those who live in the flesh don't have. And in this section, he makes that very clear. So I want to read Romans 8, 1 through 11. It says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But for those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the, on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh but are in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. You see a very clear comparison here. Paul draws very clear lines as to those who set their mind on the flesh and those who set their mind on the spirit. And as he works through this passage, he makes it clear that in those two, there's going to be a result. If you set your mind on the flesh, there's a result. If you set your mind on the spirit, there's a result. And he lays that out for us in verse 6. He says, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. What is your mind set on this morning? What has your mind been set on this week? What consumes your thoughts? What do you chase after daily? As I read through this text a few different times this morning and really trying to wrap my mind around what it means to, to set our minds on something, the only thing I could think of is when you're playing a sport, when you're playing sports or you're playing a game, there's an end goal that you're trying to get to, right? You're trying to win. You're trying to defeat the other people. You're trying to, to either score more runs or finish the game first or whatever it is. But there's a goal, and you've got your mind set on it, and you're going full throttle for it. You want to win it. You want to finish it. You want to be in first place. And when, I, when that, that, that picture came to my mind, I, I thought of the Christian life. When our mind is set on the Spirit, we chase after the things of the Spirit. We go after them. We pursue them with everything we have because we want more of it. We want to win per se. But when we put our minds on things of the flesh, Paul makes it very clear, that comes death. I haven't talked to too many people in the recent years that would rather have death over life and peace. And when the two are compared next to each other, it's a pretty easy choice. But the choice sounds easy on the end result, but we still have to live out our decision. 
What are we setting our minds on? Is it the spirit or is it the flesh? So often it's easier to set our mind on the flesh because that's what we have. That's what we can see. That's what we can touch. That we, that's, this is what we know. We understand what the flesh is and we see it every day. We see it around us. We see it in our news. We see it in our, in our world. We see it in Facebook. Flesh is very evident. And the works of the flesh are also very evident. But as Christians, as people called out as the church of Christ, we need to set our minds on the Spirit. Chase after the Spirit. Go after the Spirit. And this morning as we continue with our worship service, as we continue singing and as we continue reading God's Word and getting into God's Word, I trust that our minds stay chasing after the Spirit. If we do, we will get life and we will get peace. Let's pray. Father, this morning, again, we thank you for just the sacrifice and the amazing availability that you gave to us to come to you. We thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to lay down your life, that you were willing to do this for your church. And God, as we have gathered this morning, we pray that we would chase after your spirit, that our minds would be set on your spirit, because we want life and we want peace. Lord, we know that the flesh and having our minds set on the flesh brings death. And God, as, as we continually get tempted to go that direction, we pray that you would uh, be there for us, that you would walk with us, that you would warn us, um, and that we would just continue to see those things and those, those ways that we chase after the flesh and, and walk away from them. Because God, we want more of you and we want more of what you give us. Because we know those are good things and you promised good things to us. So Jesus, we pray that your blessing and your spirit would be here this morning. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Call. Mm, come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne, and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those re Refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets. Before we reach the heavenly fields, before we reach the heavenly fields or walk the golden streets or walk the golden streets we're marching to zion beautiful beautiful zion we're marching upward to zion the beautiful city of god then let our songs abound and every tear be dry we're marching through emmanuel's ground we're marching through emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high to fairer worlds on high we're marching to zion beautiful beautiful zion we're marching upward to zion the beautiful city of god when I sing these songs, I always, I'm a person who likes to read them in notes and like enjoy singing the tenor parts and stuff. Um, sometimes I forget to sing and worship with these hymns. 
And I just encourage you as we go ahead um, to continue in that throughout this whole service. Um, the next song is number 582. Number 582, I'm pressing on the upward way. Mm -hmm. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, lift my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's table and a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright, but still I'll pray till I'm now found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Thank you very much. You may be We thank you so much for his willingness to speak your word and to share from your word this morning. We thank you that he stands on your truth. And Lord, we, we expect to hear this morning a message from your word. And we're excited to know uh, what you have for us. So Father, may your Holy Spirit come and uh, open our ears, open our minds, and, and just touch our hearts so that we can change and to be more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. <clears throat> Christian greetings to each of you this morning. As a child, I very well remember hearing evangelist Billy Graham as he would speak. And after, and even later in life, I've read a number of his books. And one of the things that I really appreciate about Billy Graham was the fact that over and over again in his sermons and even in his books, he would say this phrase, the Bible says, the Bible says. And that's what he would base his message on, and I think that's what he based his life on, was what the Bible says. And that originally was the title of the message as I started out earlier in the week. The title was to be the Bible says, but I changed it. I changed it to, but God says. And I did that because as I look in the society around us, people do not know what the Bible says. There is an ignorance of biblical knowledge in our society. We are almost living in a society that's in a coma 
of unrighteousness. And in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, the Bible says, and no, it's not just what the Bible says, but it's what God says. And it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. God says, Woe. Woe to those who do that. This past week in Canada, a 16-year-old teenager, Josh Alexander, was arrested and put in handcuffs. His crime? He was handing out Bibles on the street. The police came and warned him that he was to stop. He continued to hand out Bibles, so they put him in handcuffs and arrested him. As I stop and as I think and as I ponder, how has our society got to this place, to this point? How have we gotten to the point where middle-aged people if you ask them the meaning of the rainbow, they don't have a clue what the true meaning is. A lot of society, if you ask them the meaning of the rainbow, they would connect it to the LGBTQ society. I asked my phone, I went to Safari, my search engine, and I said, what's the meaning of the rainbow? And they said, it's one of God's beautiful creations for us to enjoy. Siri didn't have a clue what the meaning of the rainbow is. The truth is no longer acceptable. They argue that there is no absolute truth. That truth is only relative. Truth is whatever you want it to be. And that's what they're teaching. Not just our students in college, but in our schools. That truth is what you want it to be. There is no absolute truth. And then to further it, they have what they call inclusion. No child left behind. No person left behind. Everybody is equal to everyone else. This morning I want us to go to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. These verses came to my mind as I was contemplating about how we have gotten to where we are at. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, God says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. 
And I think that's why we as a society are where we are, are today. We would rather enjoy pleasure. We would rather enjoy the good things of life. And God says, know this. Know this. That this is what's coming. This is what's going to take place. There are going to be perilous times. There are going to be times when people are no longer going to accept what is good. They're going to call it evil. And what is evil, they're going to call good. Several weeks ago, I was driving through the town of Watertown on my way to a job site. And I saw these two individuals on the sidewalk, and they were definitely enjoying each other's company. And as I passed by, it was evident that they were both males. And it practically turned my stomach. I felt sick. I felt this pit within me. As I saw how they were reacting with each other. I'm not going to go through that whole list there up there. You can see them. You can read them. You know. But I just want you to realize that God says, know this. These are the things that we as Christians, we as a church, are confronted with. And yes, it's troubling. But also, I think we need to realize what's behind all this. This didn't happen overnight. This came on very gradually. Satan is behind all of this. Satan is the one who is orchestrating this. Satan is a deceiver. And gradually, he's come into the lives and the hearts of our society and deceived them to the point where they call good evil and evil good. One of the main areas that Satan has attacked is that of marriage. Marriage was the very first institution that God ordained. In Genesis chapter 2, Verse 18, God says, it's not good for man to be alone. So He took Adam, and out of the rib, out of Adam, He created woman. And He brought woman to Adam. And He performed the first marriage. God said, that for this reason, a man is going to leave his father and his mother, and he's going to be joined to his wife. That is the building block of our society, marriage. And Satan knows that if he can get the marriages destroyed, he can destroy society. 
So one of the most important things that we as a church can do is strengthen our marriages. And I'm excited for the new marriage ministry that's going to be taking place here at Nomberg that has, I don't think it's been shared with many people yet. That we are looking at a program from Grace Ministries where four times a year on a Saturday, couples will come together, they'll see a video, and then they'll, they'll work together as couples on answering questions. This is for couples who have been married two weeks, couples who have been married 50 years can benefit from this ministry. And I'm excited about that. Because I think that is the core block. That is something that is so important that it needs to be emphasized. Growing up, June was always dairy month. It was a good excuse to go to Schultz's or to Wishy's or someplace and eat ice cream. Because June was dairy month. But now June has become gay pride month. And sadly to say, even in our county of Lewis County, there are going to be a lot of activities centered around the LGBTQ community. What is my reaction? What do I do? As a church, what are we going to do? Are we going to remain silent? Are we going to sit back and not do anything? That's what happened in 1964. Ray Roe versus Wade. And because the Church of America kept silent, millions of babies have been aborted. The church kept silent and said there was a separation of church and state. And that was the state's responsibility. God said that anyone who takes life is guilty of murder. In the LGBTQ community, Basically, everything that we know is dismissed. Everything that we stand for as believers is of no value. Marriage can be any combination that you want. You can have two men, you can have two women. Now there's even group marriages. There's three women that are married together. And they're going to have a baby. I don't know how that works. In California, there's a group marriage where there's two men and three women. Five, all married together. Where have we gone as a country, as a society... I think it's important that we know and that we let our children and our youth know what God says. And if you turn to Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, we have Jesus there speaking. And He says in Matthew chapter 19, when He's answering the Pharisees when they question Him, He says, In verse 4, and he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them, catch this, male and female? And said, For this reason, 
a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then the two no longer then the, they no longer are two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no man separate. Jesus said, from the very beginning, God made them male and female. And God said, for this reason, a man was going to leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 8. Once again, Mark writing and quotes the words of Jesus. And he says in 6, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. And then also go with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. The book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 15. God says, But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Those will not enter into heaven. Now, I want to make this very clear, that what God says is truth. And God says, those are not going to enter into heaven who are sexually immoral, who are sorcerers, who are murderers, who are idolaters. But notice, He also says, those who practice a lie. Sometimes I feel convicted that I'm practicing a lie even when I don't speak. If I know what's good, And I know what's evil. And I'm willing to remain silent. I'm practicing a lie. When I'm not willing to stand up, to declare what I know is truth, not my opinion, Not my desires, not my wishes, but that which is truth, that which God says. And I remain silent. I think God says, I'm practicing a lie. So the question is, what am I going to do as a believer? What are we going to do as a church? When we speak about eternity, and we speak about our society with an inclusive nature and policy, that there's no one left behind. Everyone's going to heaven as long as they're sincere. As long as they believe that what they are doing is right. That's all that matters. As long as my kind acts outweigh my evil acts, God will surely let me in. But God says in Matthew, back to the book of Matthew again, chapter 24,
36 through 40. And it's speaking about that day when we are going to be taken out of this world when Christ returns. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Listen to this. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days of Noah before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. The Scripture also says that two men are going to be in the field. One is going to be taken. One is going to be left. Two women are going to be grinding at the meal. One is going to be taken. One is going to be left. That sounds exclusive. Society would say that that's being very narrow-minded. But that's what God says. God says that without our relationship with Him, we are going to be left behind. 2 Peter 3, 8 through 13, a scripture there that tells us about God's heart. We know that it's not God's will that any should perish. How do we know that? Because God sent His one and only Son to pay the price for our sin. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8-13, through 13, God says this, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the, day, with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works and that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's what we have to look forward to. And God says, this is my promise. This will happen. This is going to take place. John 3, verse 16, we all know. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But in verses 18 through 21 of that same Scripture, we have there that there are some that are going to be condemned because of their unbelief. 18 through 18 through 21 of chapter 3. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, 
that they have been done in God. There is a condemnation for those who do not believe. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, we have a list of those who will not enter into heaven. It's the unrighteous, the fornicators, the idolaters, the adulterers, the homosexuals, the sodomites, the thieves, the covetous, the drunkards, the revilers, the extortioners. That's a list that Paul gives to the Corinthians, and he says, these will not enter into heaven. But he goes on and he says, but such were some of you, but you've been washed, you've been cleansed, you've been made new by the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, there is no one who is out of hope. Sometimes I look at society and I think there is absolutely no hope. But the Bible says, God says, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.9 There is not a sin that I can commit. There is not a sin that you can commit that is not pardonable if you come to God and confess it. The only sin that God is not going to forgive is the sin of unbelief. If I refuse to heed the Holy Spirit and to submit to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that's the only sin that God will not forgive. He will punish. There's condemnation. Where does that leave us? What is my response to the society that God has placed me in? Do you believe, do I believe that God has placed us here in this place for this time and for this season just the same as He did Queen Esther? Am I willing to come to the point in my life like Queen Esther did, and say, I'll go. If I perish, I perish. Am I willing to get to the point where I'm, I'm willing to go, where I know that God is asking me to go, regardless of the cost and the consequence? Jesus In his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, just before he was going to the cross, he prayed and he says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus' prayer for each one of us. Jesus does not want us to go off and be in our own little corner all by ourselves. He said, I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil. Is there evil around us? Absolutely. But what's God calling me to do? What is God calling you to do in the evil that we find ourselves living in? What is He asking
if these people, those who practice homosexuals, the gays, the lesbians, whoever they are, if these people do not experience God's love from us, where are they going to find it? If I hold them as far away from me as possible, how are they going to hear that there's a God who loves them? How do I share with those who have a difference from what I understand? And I think if we look in Scripture, we can find an answer. In John chapter 7, we have the high priests and the Pharisees And they sent a group of officers, soldiers, to go and arrest Jesus. They come back, they don't have Jesus. And the chiefs and the high priests and the Pharisees, they're wondering, what's up? Why didn't you bring Jesus back? Their response, no man ever spoke like this man before. And listen to their response to those who said that in verses 45 through 49 of chapter 7. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in Him? Now listen to this, catch this. But this crowd does not know the law and is accursed. The scribes, the Pharisees, the rulers, the religious rulers, they saw the crowds of people who were listening to Jesus as being ignorant, as unlearned who could not discern good from evil. That was their attitude. Their attitude was that they were above the crowd. They had an attitude of condemnation on those who were listening to Jesus. Now turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we have a story of Jesus and His reaction. Mark chapter 1, verse 40 says, Now a leper came to Him, imploring Him, kneeling down to Him, and saying to Him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Catch what Jesus... Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out His hand and touched Him and said to Him, I am willing to be clean. The Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, they had condemnation. Jesus said He was filled with compassion. A leper was not supposed to come within a hundred feet of a clean person. As they were walking down the street, or in, in wherever they were going, they were to have their mouths covered and, and be shouting, unclean, unclean, unclean. And believe me, the crowds gave them space. There was no worry about them having to jostle to get through a crowd. If they were calling unclean, the crowds vanished. They were nowhere to be seen. Jesus, filled with compassion, reached out and touched him. Am I filled with enough compassion 
to reach out and touch the unclean society that I'm living in. That was the difference between religion and the gospel. The Pharisees had condemnation. Jesus had compassion. In closing this morning, if you were a person that was living in our community, what would be one thing that you would think of that they would know that Nomberg Mennonite Church cares? What is it that we as a congregation can do to be a presence in our community to know the community would know that we care for them. And then, what is the one thing that I would do that our community could see that I care, that I have compassion, that I have love for them and where they're at? Because you see, if I stand there and I point a finger at them and I tell them that they're a sinner because of what they are doing, they are not going to respond. They are not going to see love. And yet, we need to show them. We need to show them. Because if we don't, we're practicing a lie. I had an illustration this morning, and when I left the house, I knew I was forgetting something. And when I stood up in the pulpit, I remembered what it was. It was my object lesson. My object lesson was, while we were in Israel, we bought some fancy little goblets, about that high. I was going to bring one of those fancy goblets, and I also have a gallon jug of insecticide that on the label has a skull and a crossbones. It's poisonous. I was going to bring those two items and set them up here and then have us visualize what it would be like if that goblet was filled with that poison And I would see someone come up, and they were thirsty. And they would pick that goblet up. Beautiful goblet. It's got liquid in it. If I remain silent, it would be death. I have the responsibility to warn them. Somehow I have to get through to them that what's in that beautiful goblet is not good for them. And that's exactly where our society is. They're looking for pleasure. They're looking at that beautiful goblet and they think whatever's in there is good for them, that they'll enjoy it. And it's poison it will lead to their spiritual death. What is God calling us 
too. I think He's calling us to a ministry of compassion. There are all kinds of ways that we as individuals and we as a church can share that compassion with the world around us, with the community in which we live. There are churches who are doing stone soup suppers. Free of charge. Anyone is welcome to come. There are churches who have ample acreage. And they have people that love to garden. So there's gardens on the church properties. And in the summertime, there's a stand where people can come. And they can get vegetables, fruits, free of charge. There's a church in Detroit, Michigan, that every year they put on a day of celebration for law enforcement officers and their families. There's hamburgers, there's hot dogs, there's kid rides for the kids to go on. Everything is free. They do it because they want to share with their community their appreciation for what the law officers do for them. There's other churches that will, for one month, sponsor a cafe or a coffee shop where any police officer that comes in with their uniform on gets free coffee. My challenge is for us to find ways to show compassion to the community so the community knows that we love them. Once they find out we love them, and they find out that God loves them, they come to that place where they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord, then let God take care of their lives. He will change them. The Scripture says He will make them into a new creation. Shall we pray? God, we thank You this morning that You have said. And we thank You that Your Word is truth. We thank You that it does not change because You do not change. So, Father, help us to stand upon the truth of Your Word. May Your Word sanctify our lives. Father, we pray that You might touch us and give us hearts like Jesus. Hearts that are full of compassion. Lives that are willing to say, I am willing and reach out and touch that which is unclean. Father, we thank You so much that we have experienced Your forgiveness in our lives. And Father, help us to remember that yes, if it was not for the grace of God, that that would be me. That I would still be a sinner. Father, we thank You. We praise You for that which You are going to do through our lives when we commit our lives to You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.